I think we'll get started on our afternoon panel. Um, I'm Devjani Ganguly from the University of Virginia, where I direct the Institute of Humanities and Global Cultures. And it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome our speakers this afternoon on the topic, New Cartographies of Knowledge, Global South, and the Global Education. Um, it's, it's a particular privilege uh, for me to be able to chair this panel with uh, our three distinguished colleagues who are among the world's leading scholars uh, interrogating the idea of the Global South. They, their insights into what we understand by this really large rubric has, has um, uh, provided so many insights over these years. And I'm very, very grateful for the amount I've learned from all three. Um, so it's particularly humbling to be here and have the privilege of introducing them. So um, in order for us to, I guess, have a minimal starting point about thinking the Global South once our speakers and respondent has spoken, uh, at the very least, given that we are talking of new cartographies of knowledge, I would, I guess, begin with the point that Global South is an unsettled and unsettling epistemic frame from which to contemplate the world. Uh, some think of it as a post-Cold War era replacement for the third world. And so primarily covering Africa, Latin America, South, Southeast Asia, but not Europe, not America, and the Mediterranean worlds. While others use it synonymously with the idea of underdevelopment and deprivation wherever these are found. Where we critical uh, theorists and humanists are concerned, uh, we, I think there's some consensus that the Global South is no longer just a metaphor for poverty, oppression, or suffering, or just a simplistic hemispheric understanding of, of regions below the equator. Rather, it is a multidimensional cartographic conception that challenges the centuries-old ordering of the world that began with the rise of Europe in the 15th century and the emergence in the 16th century of modern cartography aligned with a proto-international legal system, one that gave rise to what Carl Schmitt called linear global thinking. Such linear thinking aligned space making with the language of civilizational and epistemic advantage, a historical geography whose lineaments are hotly contested and have been contested for decades now. So in other words, Global South's role as a disordering episteme is what really our illustrious panel will illuminate for us today. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome our two speakers, uh, Juan Obario and Sarah Natal. Uh, Juan, uh, as you heard Judith yesterday say, he is going to edit the journal associated with the consortium called Critical Times Interventions in, in Global uh, Critical Theory. One is uh, also, he directs um, the Global South program currently at the University of St. Martin in Buenos Aires, and also teaches anthropology at Johns Hopkins. A very distinguished scholar who has held many prestigious fellowships around the US and the world, including cur currently, or he's just coming out of a fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Um, uh, he serves on many boards of humanities uh, uh, organizations, including the Consortium of Humanity Centers and Institutes. And he's the author, he works on African history and primarily his, his field is Mozambique. Um, our um, second speaker, Sarah Natal, again a very distinguished scholar and almost synonymous with scholarship uh, emanating in contemporary humanities uh, from South Africa. Um, Sarah uh, directs the, uh, the Institute, the Wits Institute of Social and Economic Research, Visor in Johannesburg, um, and um, is the author of many influential collections and including her, her own uh, book, um, Entanglement, Literary and Cultural Reflections on Post-Apartheid. Sarah, too, has held many prestigious visiting um, uh, appointments at Yale, at Duke, at Harvard in the last few years, and we are really privileged to have her here today and share her insights with us. 
Our respondent this afternoon is Professor Premesh Lalu, uh, who directs the Center for Humanities Research at the University of Western Cape in Cape Town, and also a historian at the same university. Um, uh, Premesh is, to put it mildly, a force of nature. Premesh, <laughs> I've known Premesh for, for many, many years now, and because we are both colleagues on the Consortium of Humanities Research and Institutes, and he is a powerhouse uh, generating uh, projects, artists, you know, uh, uh, on, on art, on intellectual history, critical theory, and a, and a huge institutional collaborator across many regions of the world. Uh, and I'm sure he will have many provocations in his own response to Sarah and Juan's paper. So with that introduction, I hand over to Juan Obario. Thank you very much, Dibjani. Um, I am very honored to be here at the launch of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. And I want to thank the organizers of the conference, of course, uh, Rossi Braidotti, Judith Butler, and Raffaele Laudani, and also my friends and comrades here with me uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak about the task, the critical task of the university, a bit of description. Then I'm going to reference the South, and I will end with a few proposals for North-South articulations. Uh, critical times. The contemporary moment is marked by deep, prolonged social and political crisis. These are indeed critical times that set new critical tasks for the university. Today, academic work has two basic options. It can be complicit with the current context and produce technical functionalist analysis and diagnosis, at best helping to soften the harshest effects of current policies, or it can fulfill its historical critical mission, generating research toward interventions that denounce the present extreme forms of social inequality and segregation and offer new potential social imaginaries that have been occluded by current formations of power. At present, the classical form of the university as site of research and higher learning is rapidly being transformed to the point that we can envision its metamorphosis into a very different kind of machinery in the near future, which might include the disarticulation and subdivision of the different units that have been historically held together within the classical model of the Western University. The fragmentation brought about by decades of social and economic policy might surely undermine the image of the university as a homogeneous totality. The universe embodied in the university might be already involved within a tendency to divide it into multiple different smaller worlds and scales the slower rhythms of critical thought and the cadence of in-depth research do not bode well with the instantaneity of financial transactions and the velocity of the demands posed by global markets. The government and development of the university have moved from a previous equilibrium between letters and numbers to the current hegemony of algebraic formulas, algorithms, and big data. The modes of evaluation of the labor performed at the university are also changing under the hegemony of mathematical modeling and rankings that fundamentally measure profitability, productivity, and marketability. The legal and financial rules that frame higher education today tend mostly toward a normalization of the status quo and the production of a mild equalization of the social. It is not necessary here today to rehearse once again a detailed presentation of how current global geopolitics and the prevalence of extreme exclusionary neoclassic policies have crippled the body politic, dismantled localized forms of solidarity, and destroyed livelihoods by means of an almost absolute privatization of the commons. The exponential growth of finance capital has at the same time, eroded state sovereignty 
and the political control of the economy and the social, as well as subsume large populations into degraded living and working conditions, creating also surplus po populations that are completely excluded from the social, that have been abandoned both by the law and the market and will not be reincorporated into any form of productive labor. The hegemony of financial capital aims at replacing the creative reproduction of subjectivities and communities and the joyful practices of living labor with the instant nostalgia for the present of societies of spectacle and the false panacea of consumption. At the same time, the nexus between war and finance capital is also evident with the spectacle of conflict and occupation fueling economies that are prone to repetitive crisis. The university is currently caught up within the process of so-called global corporatization of higher education, driven both by finance and real estate. This context is marked by the decrease in government funds, reallocation of public funding, increased dependence on market-driven activities, tuition and private donors, yet the university can still produce from within this social world an imminent critique of globalization and its financially driven corporatization. Today, when academic work is subsumed within the universal privatization of the economic and intellectual commons, the production and circulation of common knowledge as critique becomes a fundamental task of the university. This should include the fight against the excessive individualism and the metric measure of intellectual value that increasingly hegemonize academic life. The task of critiquing those and countering those tendencies involves the promotion of cooperation towards social inclusion in an age of curtailing of public institutions as well as of the expropriation and commercialization of local knowledge. We have before us today as well the critical task of defending the public university and advancing and rewarding public scholarship, public interventions in different media formats and venues aimed at different publics that need to be acknowledged today as a crucial aspect of university life. Another critical feature of our contemporary moment has to do with the predicament of populations on the move, of communities unfolding within movements of exodus and exile. It has to do with the potential or the impossibility of travel faced by populations that are fleeing war, violence, famine or disease and the disastrous after effects of new geopolitical designs. The current large crisis of refugees with concomitant episodes of xenophobia and racist violence occur both among populations that are attempting to cross national borders as well as with internal migrants and minorities within various nation states. The university is charged with the task of producing critical perspectives on the right to mobility and national belonging in a contemporary world of neo-colonial practices of classification and segregation of groups, as well as of governmental fixing and displacing of populations and of curtailing of the freedom to connect across communities and to seek new common horizons. Here, the university has to produce interdisciplinary spaces connecting law, critical thought, global humanities and language in order to reveal and record these experiences within humanitarian crisis in a post-humanistic world and then generate expert interventions that can have a concrete political impact. Our contemporary political time is of course also marked by the revival of forms of authoritarianism and violent negations of otherness and difference while the current context cannot be compared to the classical fascisms of the mid-20th century with their mobilization of masses and their alliance with high industrial capital, nevertheless, 
the world witnesses today from the US and Europe to South America to Turkey, India, the Philippines, and so on. An alarming increasing wave of politics of nationalism, fanaticism, racism, religious intolerance, and curtailing of rights. The university has the explicit political and moral mandate to denounce the attacks on freedom and on the citizens' universal entitlement to economic well-being and to belonging in the nation state regardless of particularities. Yet the state's persecution and harassment of citizens in general often includes especially the targeting of dissenting voices, in particular university faculty and academic researchers that are subjected to censorship, surveillance and repression. Here, international solidarity among scholarly and political networks is needed today, which might involve setting up academic programs for faculty and research exchange and rapid response projects of academic conferences and field research within critical situations. In a contemporary moment in which dominant tendencies aim at dissolving all forms of social solidarity and commonality, favoring an acute individualism and the shaping of subjects supposed to act like corporate entrepreneurs of themselves, the university has before itself the critical task of fostering these practices of international solidarity among scholars across geographies and hierarchies. This should be achieved through the creation of new networks, public interventions, or responses to critical events in articulation with other social organizations outside the academy. The dominance of neoclassic economic policy and the subsequent expansion of the logic of the markets on all social worlds have as its main effect the destruction of all previous forms of social solidarity. The privatization of common production and property erodes most forms of social cooperation. The university today, both in the north and the south, faces a daunting critical task related to the mandate to promote knowledge and applied scientific research that can help the restoration of social textures, intersubjective and intercommunal relations beyond absolute individualism and of practices of solidarity towards the other, and also aimed at she who embodies difference. A reclaiming of social fields such as health, education, social rights, from the logics and temporalities of financial markets. The university also has to produce critical perspectives that revise the current process of absolute pluralization in which a minuscule top tier of universities are now endowed with the capacity to produce advanced research, and the rest, the vast majority, are destined to become higher complex versions of technical colleges, teaching applicable practical basic skills. This ongoing process prevalent in the global north and falls in parallel with the expansion of science, technology, engineer and mathematics at the expense of restrictions on training and critical thinking and humanistic research. Subsumed within the structures of finance, the demands of security, the legal normalization of the social, the precarization of labor, the university appears too constrained to constitute a suitable external source of critical views. We inhabit a social world mar marked by spectacle, the proliferation of multiple regimes of truth and language games. The university is today also immersed in an intellectual climate marked by an extreme suspicion on hermeneutics of hidden dynamics or the unveiling of deeper meanings and levels of causality. Besides the attack on critical thinking, the present is also marked by the effacement of long-term historical consciousness. The university appears as being almost absolutely caught up within and determined by the dynamics of these dominant political and economic exclusionary forces. 
But if we can still imagine the university as a site of critical thinking that puts in question the logics of the political and the economy, as well as the partitions of the sensible and the social, then even within the current social context, the university might become at least a source of imminent critique of the system of government in which we live. If today there is almost no critical distance, no exterior point with regard to the global hegemony of security and finance, can the global south as peripheral space become a conceptual and geographical location for such critique? Can the university in the global south constitute a pharmacon, simultaneous poison and remedy operating within the internalization of the academy and the global circulation of knowledge. This section is entitled North-South Disarticulations. Despite a global moment of mistrust in ideologies of progress, the university still has various missions related to documenting and denouncing the extreme injustices and violences of the contemporary world. Can the Global South be perhaps a category that produces such critique of the political economy of the circulation of knowledge? The category of the South emerged only after the end of the Cold War, when then the world began to be imagined as one, as a more or less homogeneous totality. I would like to suggest that globalization is a military term, a geopolitical category that stem from the victories and defeats in transnational wars. It's also a financial category as its rise accompanied the progressive hegemonization of the economy by transnational finance capital. Global South, a category made possible by this new globalized condition, refers to various scattered regions which occupy a peripheral space within this new militarized geopolitical order whose temporalities are calibrated by the speed of financial markets. The South is a territory without defined borders. It can be thought of as a series of parallel comparable histories. The South has fundamentally been shaped by processes of neo-colonial political violence, repression, partition, and interconnected trajectories of imperialism, interruptions of the nation state and of national popular projects. Today, the global south can also be conceptualized as a series of spaces emerging from post-totalitarian situations. The south internal conflicts have largely stemmed from transnational schemes that have connected different regions of the world. One of the critical tasks of the university today is to promote South-South comparative research. The different regions of the Global South should be approached in a comparative epistemological plane. For instance, the study of democratic transitions in Latin America illuminates similar processes that occurred later in Africa or even recently during the Arab Spring. State definitions of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity derived from colonialism inherited by African and Asian post-colonial states are fertile grinds for rethinking in different ways the prevalent social structures today in Latin America. Neo-colonial mechanisms of global scope, such as structural adjustment and the crisis of sovereign debt, as well as military occupation and counterinsurgency, articulate disparate political histories, economic temporalities, and trans-regional spaces. Today, the dynamics of extractive capital with its methods and effects, which are repeated across regions, also pave the way for comparative epistemological work within South-South perspectives. Universities based both in the North and the South are firmly inserted within this geopolitical context of finance and militarization, although, of course, in different ways and in different degrees. Developments in security, finance, and real estate are behind some of the crucial transformations that universities are undergoing today in terms of funding, the privatization of public education, budget cuts, termination of programs, 
the promotion of engineer and applied science, and the exponential growth of bureaucratic administrative structures. It is also a current task of a critical university to research the governmental, military, and financial logics behind the apparent inevitable transformation, the downsizing and outsourcing of that university today. This brief section is called South as Critic. The category of the South can function as a catalyst for rethinking the critical task of the university. To think South means to suspend the usual assumptions about the university held in the North, which are currently being exported as a new universal paradigm. Reflecting on the project and the promise of the Global South, we can deploy this turn of phrase, thinking South, to refer to the production of social knowledge situated in world regions that are peripheral to globalization. Whereas the territorial definition of the South is imprecise, perhaps it can be thought of as an event, as the materiality of a certain experience and the production of autonomous thought about this experience. Although North and South are extremely general terms, and the financial model of accumulation of globalization is not teleological, and it certainly implies that enclaves of South are located in the North and vice versa, still a couple of main features should be pointed out. The South can be generally defined as an economy and a social world marked by precarity and precariousness. The South is a series of territories in which the most negative socioeconomic, violent, and environmental effects of globalization are experienced and endured to a heightened degree, given the feeble nature of local social textures of infrastructures and institutions. It can be argued that the Global South is often located at the forefront of political and economic processes, as was the case with neoliberal policies implemented for the first time by military dictatorships in South America and their advice of infamous Chicago School economists in the mid-1970s, and only later imported back to the USA and Europe with the Reagan, Thatcher, and Giscard d'Estaing administrations. Something similar can be said for the effects of massive indebtedness and the structural adjustment in the 1980s or the impact of extractivist industries in the late 90s. Evidently, the term South is performing some very concrete epistemic and political work within the discourse of a globalized world that has made necessary its sudden strong emergence. A working hypothesis would posit the South as a space of economic relations determined by debt, uneven development, and a highly unequal extractive model of accumulation it is crucial not to think about the South in territorial terms as a matter of scale, but rather as a form of life, exploring entanglements and mediations between fields that Western modernity has presented as separate and that appear in the South within interconnected configurations and entangled temporalities. The South is an assemblage of singular forms of life that has generated its own proper thinking on the textures that they inhabit. Southern theory recombines in different ways the classical metaphysical relations between subject and object and the metaphysics of presence and domination established between the subject and the world within Western modern epistemes. Usually in the South, the strict borders between the university and the public sphere, the political, social movements, and media are blurred. This might be changing due to globalization of the American system of metric evaluation of knowledge and the preeminence of certain northern journals and publishing houses. Yet, the theorization of the social generated in the South is produced not only by academics, but also by public intellectuals and social movements in response to demands from the public sphere, economic and political structures. 
Today, Southern theory is produced also by grassroots movements that theorize their own practices or for organizing an action as well as local conditions and the impact of global flows of capital and technology. It can be argued that just as in political terms the local produces inflections that mediate and refract the global, modifying it, in the same way, Southern theory produces an inflection on thought itself. It generates a modulation, a nuancing of how thinking has been conceptualized since Western classical modernity. The landscape of innovative epistemic and methodological conceptualization in the South usually materializes in the form of the essay, which stands in contrast with the rest of the production of social knowledge, which mostly presents a technocratic bent, mainly determined by the pressures of multilateral financial agencies and the development industry. This type of social knowledge circulates under the form of the dry, standardized, indexed academic paper, the taxonomic survey, or the consultancy report. Within the economic crisis of the university in impoverished and indebted economies of the South, development agencies become the main contractors of social thought, geared then towards solutions to merely technical problems and reducing the political to a utilitarian calculus and to practices of good governance. I'll conclude this section. It is necessary to weigh the dimension and relevance of the Southern theories to discuss the current institutional context and the financing of the production of social knowledge in the South. A few questions. Which social and political elites of knowledge are today the legitimate generators of theory? How do capital flows enable today the theorizing of the social? What are the current strategic struggles on decisions to privilege certain areas and objects of research. The creativity of Southern theory prompts the debate on this global political economy of knowledge. But what is the added value provided by the theory produced in the South to the markets of cognitive capitalism and the society of information? Who theorizes the South? Who has access to concepts and information imported from abroad, which can then be modified, paving the way to new localized conceptualizations? My last brief section on theory as the southern question, and then a few propositions. The southern question. We must dissect the structures of hierarchy and the dynamics of accumulation and circulation of theory. The recent critiques are well known and they point out the fact that while the South is seen as a repository of data and raw evidence illustrating empirical facts, the North constitutes the place of extraction of data towards its processing and translation into theory. Southern theory puts in question this international status quo and the picture of the South as an archive of catalogues, taxonomies, and databases by conceptualizing, producing new abstract discourse and figures, constellations of thought stemming from local histories, regional knowledges, and communal experiences, often not in sync with the temporalities prevalent in the North. From the Enlightenment philosophies to the modernization theory to development programs, Western modernity has been posed as the true original parameter of progress, and all other modernist processes taking place in the South have been usually regarded as mere degraded copies or unfinished imitations. In the linear teleologies of reason, the South or the Orient or the Third World, the non-aligned world, has always been depicted as being deferred. Its future, usually portrayed as the eternal return of the same, and its historical transformations understood as late arrivals. Critics in the global north usually come to expect that southern aesthetic production will only represent local histories and national allegories, to use 
Frederick Jameson's concept. The aesthetic or intellectual production from the South seemingly needs to be a simulacrum, a more or less exotic copy of Western liberal universalism. In contrast to this, the South emerges today as a space of deep experimentation, recombining the rich artistic, intellectual, and political languages of the past, then it might be prefiguring the near future of the West itself. Whereas the colonies had always been the initial laboratory of modernity, today there is an extended and canny feeling about the modes in which developments in the South might anticipate Euro-American futures. In today's global order, which is a multiple entry scheme, a variegated canvas, the terms global, regional, and local do not refer anymore to matters of scale, but rather to rhythms and temporalities, as well as to various entangled dimensions and folds. It is necessary to engage the historical context of the colonial background of current globalization in order to revise the previous colonial and now neoliberal forms of production and circulation of knowledge and its exclusionary teleological reason. In order to understand, and I finish before my final propositions, in order to understand the nature of the contemporary global moment, we may leave behind the project of provincializing Europe and instead we might attempt to universalize the South and show how regions such as the Sahel or the Andes, Bengal, the Indian Ocean or the Mediterranean are not mere local particularities, but rather constitute hubs of potentiality located at the avant-garde of intellectual ventures that build on centuries of historical texture and cultural formations. To conclude very quickly, a few proposals for discussion. If the university is going to fulfill its mandate to intervene towards social inclusion and social justice, then another current critical task is the mandate to address and redress inequalities between universities of the North and the South. This implies fostering more even collaborations, imagining new forms of triangulation among regions, as well as the promotion of a more horizontal international circulation of knowledge and language. The questions at stake are, who is legitimized to have a global comparative perspective? Who can posit its own local particular imagination as a new universal? Who occupies a vantage point that allows the writing of global history? Can we think the world finally from Africa, from Latin America, or from China? A crucial task today is to build and develop universities in disadvantaged regions in the South, beyond the engagement with individual scholars that might be invited to travel, to teach, or publish in the North. How can the northern universities and donors consolidate the precarious networks of scholars operating today in the southern hemisphere? It would be positive to decentralize the until now seemingly necessary centralization of global collaborations around the wealthier universities of the north. The various regions of the south are compartmentalized and separated by history, language, the cost of travel, the lack of communication and the materiality of institutions. Scholars from the South usually encounter each other through doctoral programs, conferences, research networks or publications organized from and held in the North. The current globalized world and the generalized crisis of knowledge and resources might make possible to do it today to imagine different arrangements. The Northern University often hosts Southern scholars who during their residence might teach and give lectures. Now similar programs could be established through which Northern scholars since spend longer periods of time teaching at Southern universities, benefiting enormously from the exposure to other conversations, knowledges, and histories. Maybe it is possible to establish triangulations involving exchange 
of scholars and the training of students within programs that include one northern and two southern institutions. It's very important also to develop programs of academic visits by southern scholars to other southern regions, following the translation of their work across north and south. The recent rounds of globalization have produced new cohorts of scholars in the south that are connected to global conversations and publications in the north. But our task now is to strengthen these links as well as to encounter other clusters of brilliant scholars also based in the South who produce high quality work and do not yet travel globally, are not included in international networks and whose work circulates mostly locally, usually in languages other than English. It is crucial to develop new programs of translation of key Southern scholars into English through infrastructures that can make their work circulate widely. It is also equally important to financially secure the circulation of these translations across regions of the South, as well as to translate works from and to Portuguese, French, Arabic, and so on, and other languages that are not European languages. So scholars from different regions in the South can study the work of their peers. Translation is also important for joint North-South conferences which should be organized whenever possible with respect to the language of the participants, the host sites, and of local audiences involving translators. This would foster a more equal access to knowledge that is not predicated upon linguistic proficiency in any given language. So let me finish here. North-South collaborations are increasingly becoming more positive but they are still uneven. The Northern University is better prepared to benefit from collaborations due to previous issues of funding, of infrastructure, and training. For far too long, Southern universities have functioned as intellectual concessionary companies of schools of thought produced in the North. While the risk of the comprador intelligentsia is always with us, Today, scholars from the South that move back and forth between North and South have the crucial task of fostering the circulation of critical thinking and to produce translation across intellectual traditions. At present, more than ever, it is necessary that scholars based in the North who are aware of the critical task of the university and of the material realities of the South foster horizontal, more even collaborations between scholars of Northern, Southern University and between universities within the Global South. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Devjani. Um, when I was listening to the presentations by Sarah and Juan, I recall there was an essay that was published in the Review of African Political Economy in 1976 on the eve of the student uprisings in South Africa, um, in Soweto and around the country. Uh, and it was an essay written by two Marxist scholars who when I interviewed them 20 years later said they had never met. But according to the editors of the Afri Review of African Political Economy, they were forced into a room and, uh, to write a response. They were on either side of the political spe spectrum, one deeply embedded in the ANC with the, with the fairly left position on transforming the ANC into a workers' party, and the other, Harold Wolpe, who was a leading figure in the Communist Party, also in the ANC at the time. And one of the key issues in that essay was a thinking through of the difficulties of working out the relationship between apartheid and the critique of dependency or development of underdevelopment theory that had taken hold in Latin America. And as I heard these presentations, I thought it would be worth returning to some of those earlier unresolved questions, if you like. Um, but you will notice that through what I'm about to present to you in the reading of these papers, um, I haven't been able to work out particularly those sets of questions and connections. I think we should, we should attend to it at a later point. My task, though, has been made somewhat easier by two eloquent presentations with which I agree almost entirely. But since this is a critical theory conference, and I will need to say uh, something about 
the papers, uh, you're going to have to endure 20 minutes of uh, a presentation or a reading of these papers. I have no critique to offer, but at, ve at the very least, I have to offer, I, I offer a supplement that may help to link the concerns expressed in the two papers at hand. I want to say that, what my, that we might think about the work of the supplement here is quite crucial to a re-envisioning of the work of critical theory. What might critical theory be without the work of the supplement after all? Critical theory is less about simply carrying on a tradition than a way of doing things within neoliberal time. To this end, Juan's paper cuts to the chase when he asked whether the South is capable of being posited as a new pharmacon, or as Bernard Stiegler re uh, recently argued, a new pharma uh, pharmacology of critique as the very aperia that invites critique and renewal. The papers for this session each set to work on pressuring the idea of the South as a question that asks, what is the university for? The South here is less a destination than it is a question. But what is striking is the different speeds through which each Juan and Sarah mobilize the potential consequences of asking what is the university for from the question of the South. For Juan, there's an immediacy that calls into play the intervention of the South. For Sarah, there is a worry about the pressure of acceleration propelled by a new system of informatics. Unlike in the global north, the south admits to the possibility of two ways we hear the passing for in what is the university for. On the one hand, we hear a question about what the university is supposed to be doing now. And on the other, we hear a question about the university's standpoints. With the emergence of a new scripting of the university in the image of capital and its drive to accumulation, the question of what the university stands for seems to take precedence over the question of what the university is to be doing now. The demand is not to reverse the orders of these questions, but to realize that the opportunity exists in the South to study both senses of hearing the phrase, what is the university for, in their very simultaneity and at whatever speed. In such simultaneity, the university may open itself to a future in which it more searchingly requires its students, faculty, and workers to think ahead by asking what we should be desiring at the institutional site of the university. What I'd like to suggest is that we attend seriously to the simultaneity that underwrites the question, what is the university for? It may be that the South offers us an opportunity to set to work on the interstices between immediacy and duration. To this extent, both papers remind us that we would be remiss if we did not think of the university as more than an institution that preserves the best of what we have learned for the greater public good, even when faced with critical philistinism. Both seem to suggest that an emphasis on what the university was is relatively conservative. We need to be thoughtful, we need to think ahead. The university is perhaps to be approached less as a question of putting knowledge in the service of the public than as a space for inventing the unprecedented. What we mean by the invention of the unprecedented at the institutional site of the South may anticipate the ability of the university to negotiate between local and global demands and pressures. Universities ought to be judged against the success in achieving this mediation rather than a statistical metric that is viewed as punitive and results in the proliferation of suspicion and hatred within the university. In South Africa, the legacies of apartheid have centered the debate about the university on questions of racial redress, atonement, and access. However, within a global context, they, where the nation state no longer relies on the university for its legitimation, the question of what we share, albeit not in common, is of great importance. The dramatic reorientation, so the story goes, encounters its limit in the demands of the student movements of our day, which have placed the question of decolonization squarely on the agenda. Decolonization marks the indecision of the university torn between its local and global pressures. Much has been said about the intellectual project being driven by the discourse of decolonization. In fact, entire university administrations have been beholden to respond to the demand for decolonization. Most have responded inadequately, not for want of trying, but because the impulse towards decolonization is driven from within the disciplines of memory and aesthetics, 
that have been significantly neglected over the years. And this is the point that I think Sarah was making about the humanities. It is unclear that decolonization will not result in yet another critique of the pitfalls of national consciousness that Fanon articulated in his debate with the purveyors of negritude in the 1960s. This was when African states underwent their first wave of independence. Neither is it entirely clear that decolonization will exceed the limits of apartheid's inheritance, let alone the capacious target of neoliberalism that appears to have defined various standpoints in the university. In fact, there is nothing to suggest that decolonization will unmoor the referent of centuries old racial formation from the grip of power. However, since decolonization calls attention to an epistemic impasse in a post-colonial predicament, it paves the way for risking certain decisions about the future direction of the institutional site of the university. There is a danger in the turn to decolonization as a principle of the African university in general and, South, and the South African university in particular. Perhaps the demand for decolonization threatens to prematurely foreclose attending to a misrecognized symptom in university discourse. In South Africa, this would amount to misrecognizing the symptom of apartheid. Orienting the university to this misrecognized symptom may have consequences for how we today think about the critical tasks of the university in the world more generally. Stated differently, revealing the misrecognized symptom of apartheid in South Africa or oppression in the South may bring into relief the way in which the Kantian University of the West is locked in a conflict of the faculties that underpins its inherent nationalism and disconnect from the world. Although I will insist, as an aside, that Kant's conflict of the faculties should be read as an ironic text rather than as a manual on how to organize the university. The view that apartheid and various forms of oppression in the South can entirely be grasped through class, racial, and gender exclusion now serves to entrench the divisions across higher education institutions in the North and South. Such a view prohibits the formation of critically re-envisioning the work of the university from the perspective of what Juan playfully calls the Southern question. Sarah, too, invites us to consider how inhabiting the institutional space of apartheid's making may offer a glimpse of precisely what it means to test the limits of the 19th century university without surrendering the grounds of the university to the prescriptions of developmentalism. So what then is latent in the South that may recharge our perspective on the critical tasks of the university in our times? On this read, I would say that Juan and Sarah's papers disabuse us of the sense that oppression in the South functioned merely as a politics of exclusion for which the antidote would be greater access and representation. This oppression was less a matter of identity politics than a symptom of a global dynamic that the West is presently only now having to come to terms with. If I were to name it in terms of other than those given in the papers, I would say that oppression in the South worked to splinter the relationship of technology, mnemonic solidarities, and an aesthetics of the self, without which a system of population control grounded in a discourse of race, class, and gender oppression would be in inconceivable. Apartheid as an exemplary, as exemplary of such a project was global to begin with, not only in the sense of an experiment in biopolitics that followed the exterminations of the Nazi Holocaust. Apartheid rescripted the discourse of race inherited from Nazism in Europe and the impasse of liberal trusteeship in the former colonies such as Canada, South Africa, and Australia. To the extent that apartheid was an exemplary formation of biopolitics, we might say that it also anticipated neoliberalism as an endpoint of a concept of freedom. As such, if we translate its operation by way of a Lacanian schema, we might say that apartheid functioned less at the level of a master's discourse than it did at the level of university discourse. Unsurprising, the program of urban segregation often corresponds with the distribution of the university and specific fields of inquiry in universities in South Africa. It is in this misrecognized symptom that we may begin to imagine a university reconstituted as one that attends to redefining the critical tasks of the university. The task of the university, it seems, is to find new ways of connecting the spheres of technology, mnemonic solidarities, and aesthetics of the self. Not in the individual and prescriptive disciplinary forms, 
but across the entire institutional space of the university. This does not preclude the demand for redress, but it does require rediscovering ideas about attention and play as constitutive elements of the process of education. A university attentive to the demands of connecting technology, mnemonic solidarities, and an aesthetics of the self needs to locate itself in a longer genealogy of the emergence of the idea of the university. As much as universities are thought to advance knowledge, its reigning ideas have shifted considerably over the centuries in tandem with the ebbs and flows of the fortunes of the nation state. If at one moment the reigning idea of the university was that of reason, it later emerged as an institution grounded in a concept of culture. Today it has been appropriated to the logic of the market and a prospective future of growing indebtedness. Taken together, this latest installment of the idea of the university that appears to be proliferating globally is creating a deep sense of anxiety, alienation, and a feeling of proletarianization in which the work of thought is completely eviscerated. The university is becoming a hyper-industrialized information machine that is beginning to reveal itself as an information bomb, uh, as Paul Virilio might have put it. What is specifically distinct about the latter development is that the connection between the university and the nation state has been significantly severed, irrepar irreparably damaged. Rather than viewing this narrative as one of crisis, the severing of the relationship between the nation state and the university may be an opportunity to lay claim to another concept of the university, another universalism, one which Sarah carefully elaborates as a planetary uh, concept of the university. In contrast to the hyper-industrialized information machine, the university's uncompromising intellectual sense historically derives primarily from the idealism that brought it into being. And in the second, in its overwhelming but not exclusive location in the changed circumstances of the Second World War. Such idealism contended with the hegemonic formations of state, capital, and the public sphere in the 19th and 20th century. In Africa, the birth of the university accompanied the wave of nationalist independent movements that swept through the continent in the aftermath of the Second World War, with the promise of development underwriting its public commitments. And in South Africa specifically, the university was tied more fundamentally to the determinations, intensification, and demands of a racializing state and class formation. This, the, the distortion in the original idealism of the university has been overtaken by the long 20th century in which the university became entangled in an even more longer process of dehumanization. It has also been overtaken by a rapid expansion of technological objects through which research and teaching now extensively, are now extensively mediated, resulting in an opportunity to productively reorient the university to the world. Bound at once to a contract with the state and simultaneously to a public sphere, the university has had to reinvent, reinvent its object of study, abiding by duration and commitments to the formation of students in respect of its reigning ideas. It is in the interstice of these seemingly opposing social demands that the inventiveness of the university as an institution in the South is most discernible. Rather than being given over to the dominant interests of the day, whether the state, capital, or the public, the university ought, by virtue of its idealism, be true to its commitment to name the question that identifies the present in relation to which it sets to work, especially when that question of the present may not appear obvious to society at large. Yet in naming this question, the university is ethically required to make clear that it does not stand above society. Today, there is a growing concern that the university has lost sight of its reigning idea, the demands of radical critique and timely, timeliness, and all the contests that ensue from claims made on that idea. In the process, its sense of inventiveness has been threatened by an encroaching sense of the de-schooling of society, instrumental reason, and the effects of the changes in the technological resources of society that have altered the span of attention retentional abilities, memory and recall, and at times the very desire to think and reason. Scholars around the world bemoan the extent of plagiarism and the lack of attention on the part of their students, features that they suggest have much to do with the changes wrought by the growth and expansion of new technological resources. What binds the university as a coherent system is now threatened by the waning of attention and the changes in processes of, of retention and memory. 
In these times, retention has been consigned to digital recording devices. Students and faculty now are now compelled to labor under the illusion that the more that we store and the more that we have stored, the more we presumably know. This is why, the theory, why theory often appears as the foreigner in the room. Here again, we can learn from the South. The movement that unfolded in the 1980s at South African universities was a statement of force against the cynical reason of apartheid. But it also contained the, an element of the creative act, the process of inventing the unprecedented, which underwrote every effort at turning apartheid's rationality on its head. It is a version of the creative act that is now threatened by the onset of memory loss. It is in its place, seemingly more vacuous words have come to take the place of, a formid of formidable concepts in formation. Words such as efficiency and excellence now replace more thoughtful and thought-provoking notions of epistemological access, where the concept of epistemological access generated extensive curricular debate in the 1980s, efficiency and excellence serve as buzzwords with little or no epistemic grounding. And newer concepts of creativity are producing fantasies that may yet prove to be the nightmare for students of the future. The speculative logic of the student as an entrepreneur of the self lends itself to the promise of consumption and fulfillment, but at the same time drags students into a state of limbo and mere functionality. Against the slide into mindless creativity, an older notion of the creative act, like the notion of a work of art that resists death, must surely be a possible concept upon which to constitute a future university. This is a work of art that calls on a people that does not exist yet. It is the idea of the university that creates the space for the invention of the unprecedented. There's never been a more hazardous time to forget to ask what is the university for. The university's future resides in cutting into the future and into established knowledge. All the while, we should hear in the echoes of the past the demand to keep desire alive, to remain awake, and to, be, to constitute a community that is open to the future. The question of our time now demands that we ask how we reinvent the idea of, the, of university discourse, not just the university as an institution. We need to think once again about approaches to technology, the state and the public sphere, and how each gives a view on the desire that now remains repressed in our respective knowledge projects. We need to recuperate a sense of attention and play, and this is what I hear the two papers making, uh, gesturing us towards, of the creative act as opposed to the banality of neoliberal creativity aimed at, a, at mere entrepreneurial activity and false promise. The university committed to the task of relining technology, mnemonic solidarities, and aesthetics of the self will prove indispensable for naming our present and finding our way out of those predicaments that threaten to undermine the best of our knowledge upon which the future of our students, faculty, its workers, and that of the institution of the university rests. As the university has become unbounded from the story of the nation, partly through the proliferation of new technological resources, its passage to the universal is mediated increasingly by the effort to redefine the city and movement in the demos. The city is that which we share, but not in common. The shift we are seeing is from a university invested with pastoral power by the nation state, shifting towards attachments in the demos. Perhaps as an institution that sets its sights on the invention of the unprecedented, the university may help us exceed the national narrative of the divided city, while placing the university in service of the demos by realigning technology, mnemonic memory, and aesthetics of the self as fundamental to a revitalized practice of freedom. Now, whether we take this through the pathways charted by Juan, or whether we do this via the idea of the planetary library, is the question that we ought to all attend to. Thank you very much. All right, so the three talks are now open uh, to comments, um, uh, questions uh, from the floor. We have about, about 40, 45 minutes, um, uh, and there's a microphone. Um, yeah, Rosie. Thank you so much. This panel is hotter than the weather. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And 
I have a million questions, but I'm starting with a few. Um, uh, address essentially to Sarah with many thanks and to Ashil, wherever he's hiding. Uh, first, a point of clarification and then a comment. Um, at one point, <clears throat> when you were discussing the, the planetary and the complications of that, I heard you, I thought I heard you say that to um, actually discuss the, the possibility of a planetary university, we need to hold on to some degrees of anthropocentrism. Uh, maybe I misunderstood you. I would like you to expand on that um, uh, and whether you really would want to go for anthropocentrism and not, for instance, anthropomorphism, to go with Kate Hales and the digital people. But I'd, I'd like to hear you on this. And if I may, then my real concern, which unsurprisingly is accelerationism, particularly the part of your paper where you make that wonderful shift and uh, saying that the planetary is the intensification of the local. Okay, intensification, if we do it <clears throat> with nomadology and neospinosis ontology, is qualitative. It's a qualitative set of re-territorialization and deterritorialization. Accelerationism is not. Accelerationism a la Zizek, if I have to pronounce even that name, um, <laughs> and the Hegelian... <laughs> And the Hegelian scheme that goes with it is a quantitative accumulations of negativity, disasters, miseries, building up in a Hegelian stacking system until negativity negates itself and through the double negation, guess what? We reverse the trend and we get to the new. Now that is almost the opposite of an intensification. So I wanted to probe you on this and I've argued that intensification in the qualitative Deleuzean sense are certainly not accelerationism. Okay. I'm going to give Sarah an opportunity to respond right now. You want? Let's take a few more questions. Okay. Uh, there, there, there are two hands up there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, start with. I, I would like to give two remarks, but I would like them to could be... You, could you speak up? Okay, I would like to give two remarks, but I would like to, them to be heard as two questions. The first one is about the concept of the South, and the other one is about the translation. Um, uh, regarding the concept of the South, I have to tell you a, a little story uh, that took place in uh, Athens when we had this preparatory meeting for, for this conference. And there was, uh, over the coffee, uh, two Turkish women and one Greek woman, so Bashak Ertur, uh, Zeynep Gambetti, Athena Atanasiu that we heard today, and myself, we were talking about, is it the South applicable to this part of Europe or the world that we're living in? So Turkey, Greece, and then Serbia. Um, and what kind of name can we find, find for, for the location that we are in? So we, in the end, we jocularly ended with the Ottoman Empire as the most precise um, space that we could find ourselves in. Okay, but um, apart from being jocular, I would like to say that, I mean, I'm, I was born in the country that, that used to be Yugoslavia, uh, and it was located, albeit uneasily, um, in the East Europe. And then after its breakup, it emerged within the Balkans, and then that designation also shrank into the West Balkans, while now it is being called South Eastern Europe. Um, so the same space. What do we do uh, with these political tropes and topuses, and now I'm using Athena's again um, trope, um, how do they help us in stitching or further dividing the world as we know it into East, West, South, North, and then further to dismantling the peripheral borders that are still defined by the nation state, despite the fact that the goods and capital travel much more easier than it used to be in the times of Pax Britannica. So that would be the first question about the concept of the South. And the second one about the translation. So I think that we may be talking of the relevance of the South as a concept for the whole world if and I would dare say only if there were several languages, say Spanish, Hindu, Arabic, or some other language, that might compete with English and not as avant-garde, not as um, some local peculiarity language or some 
minority language, quote unquote, but as the equal transmitter of knowledge. Then would the translation project, and I think it's that that project is very important for all of us here, um, would make, I, I wanted to say more sense, but I think that it's precise to say make sense at all. Um, so if there is no one center, but at least several centers, so that maybe the idea of the center would become uncentered. And I wanted to finish with a, a, a tiny thought project. Um, to, um, uh, okay. Tiny, uh, one okay. sentence. One sentence, really. okay. So <laughs> let us imagine that we, all of us here, wherever we come from, prepare our manuscripts, manuscripts uh, to be pu published, for example, in Uruguay, uh, Congo, or Azerbaijan, because we want that and because we can do that. Thank you. And th there was another question uh, right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, there's uh, this recurring concept that is, came out in these first two days of uh, conference, which is that of taxonomies. So what I was about to ask uh, was, uh, um, like one way yesterday mentioned the taxonomy in this uh, um, uh, genealogy of uh, uh, Chinese humanities. Uh, today, Juan Barrio mentioned it uh, uh, in relation to Global South. The point is, uh, where does those taxonomies come from? Do, do you think that uh, is it the, the institution of university uh, which should provide uh, those taxonomies or not? Because apparently there are two different elements in this, uh, you know, critical task. There's a critical task dealing with the, the operatic issues, which aims to, you know, denaturalize and show the disavowals in, uh, I don't know, like the linearities of history and this kind of generation. Then there's the, 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 the transformative task that deals with contradiction and not uh, aporias. And I'm not saying that these are two completely different elements. But uh, of course, the necessities which uh, came out from uh, many social struggle were uh, very much different from the ones that the critical task uh, in the, within the university might focus on. So isn't there a kind of a boomerang effect in this uh, calling the global south the particularity and those kind of epistemic uh, uh, shifts Whereas uh, many concepts which came uh, also from the European uh, state-centered tradition uh, has been uh, strategically uh, re-employed by uh, social struggles, even, for example, in Latin America, let's see the notion of strike in the last feminist movement and so on. So isn't there a kind of a boomerang effect on this? Okay, thank you. We'll just turn to the panel, the range of questions here. So um, Juan, um, Sarah, do you Thank you. Um, very briefly, I will ref refer to something I have been working on, and m my paper was too long, so I left it out. But uh, I started working on this last year when I visited Weiser, uh, the center directed by Sarah in Johannesburg, and we had a series of roundtables on the South. And in those discussions, what came up for me was the question of um, the passport as, as, a, as a metaphor and, and a heuristic tool to think about these distinctions and articulations between South and North. And very briefly, because now it's a research project in itself, um, the question of for all the talk about the globalized world and the world as one, homogenous, the, the porosity of borders and so on, at the end of the day, national citizenship, the nation state, and the question of, the, of which, what passport do you hold if you, if you have access to having a passport at all is crucial. Uh, and people travel back and forth within the the structures of globalization, but people are stopped at borders, at checkpoints. Uh, some populations are allowed to have access and some uh, do not have that access. Some can visit for a certain period of time. Some are legal aliens, some are totally excluded. And I think there for me ends uh, all this uh, more abstract 
discussion um, about south and north and east uh, and the dismantling of, of an older geopolitical uh, world. The, the, f the final thing I want to mention with regard to that project is what, what I then am trying to work on as the intellectual passport, which might or might not overlap with your national citizenship, but it refers to uh, where are you allowed to enter or, or with checkpoints and borders you are uh, deterred, um, where you can visit for a certain period of time in terms of intellectual work and intellectual debates uh, and objects of research and, and debate. And I think those two issues dovetail uh, very clearly, national and regional belonging and rights and exclusion and exclusion and where you can be a citizen of a global intellectual uh, conversation. I'll stop um, there for now, there's more. You want to go ahead? Okay. Yeah, um, no, no I, don't, I don't really, I, I don't really want to defend, I, I don't really want to defend uh, anthropocentrism, anthropomorphism, and in fact, um, I think that anthropologists are getting themselves into a complete corner. Um, on the score, um, I think that the argument is around the, the invocation of the social which Latour and others are, um, are, are, are questioning, and so the discipline of anthropology begins to have terrible trouble with that. And so in other circumstances, I wouldn't want to defend the anthropocentric in any way. But when it comes to the African subject, I think they're one of two paths to go, and I haven't decided which way one ought to be going in relation to the planetary or in, in relation to multi-species ethnographies. Um, so the one says to me, um, in terrains where uh, uh, the human person's humanity has most been put in question, one ought then to retain in any multi-species work one is doing um, a strong sense of the social um, as a category that one wants to use. Um, um, but an alternative and much more compelling view is the argument that particularly in context of scarcity, and particularly in the context of Africa, Africans have long been using sort of animist assemblages to think about the African self. And so one should rather go that way um, and embrace the non-human, the more than human, and not hold on to conventional notions of the social, which the social sciences and humanities seem so wedded to particularly when it comes to um, doing work on Africa. So I'm tired and I'm becoming incoherent, but um, those are the stakes for me. And ultimately, Rosie, yeah, I wouldn't really defend that position. At the same time, I think that I just wanted to demonstrate the degree to which it's helpful in thinking about what used to be called African studies to use the insights of multi-species ethnographies, plant-human, human-plant life, um, but also to bring that back strongly at certain points to um, the constitution of the social and the constitution of the African human subject. So um, it just points me to an increasingly complex scenario for doing this kind of intellectual work. Um, but, uh, and in relation to your other uh, question, I'd really rather talk to you in detail afterwards. Um, I think that accelerationism can be taken as a form of inquiry that can help us to grasp something about the abstraction of the social at this point, but that ultimately it's a useless tactic because it's particularly useful for right-wing conspiracies. Um, and the minute it falls into the hands of the right, as it is at present, um, it becomes as destructive as it is helpful. So we can write off accelerationism as a political um, tactic, if you ask me. But there's much more to say to you about that, but I'm really, it's just really uh, difficult. And I didn't get everything that you said. Acoustics in this beautiful room are terrible. <laughs> um, and I'd rather have a longer conversation later on. Yeah. Um, very briefly about taxonomy. Um, 
When you mentioned it, it reminded me already of a, of a nice north-south intera famous interaction which is uh, Foucault's order of things uh, that begins, as you all know, with Borges' encyclopedia, which is a taxonomy that doesn't make any sense according to our rational, mostly Western standards. So there's a lot to say, but very basically, of course, the way it had been deployed uh, today, it's mostly as opposed to theory and theorization. The South as a collection of taxonomies and archives of data and evidence as opposed to the North who classically has the legitimacy to theorize. That has been changing uh, in an accelerated way uh, increasingly recently. But um, always the same political question, who has the, the right or the legitimacy to classify, to, to taxonomize? Okay, thank you all for this exciting panel. Uh, I have a question for Juan first and then Sara. Uh, Juan, you offered a quite interesting, a quite insightful um, way of speaking about, uh, you spoke about universalizing the South um, as a probably a, a, a um, kind of uh, antidote to a pursuit of um, either universalizing the North or provincializing Europe. So I'm wondering uh, if you could expand a little bit on that. How, how come you think that this universalizing the South would work critically as an antidote to both uh, apparatuses of universalizing the North, which is the, the, the existing canon, I suppose, and provincializing Europe at the same time? Uh, what is it that you find uh, radically enabling or critical about this? So I would like to hear more about that, if it's possible. Um, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm implying here is, don't you think that this can run the same risks as uh, a project of universalizing the North or provincializing the South? Um, so that's, that's the one. And then, Sarah, you, you fleetingly mentioned the Komarovs and their project of theory. I guess the, the book is called Theory from the South. Uh, I'm curious if, if, you, if you feel like talking a little bit more about, about that. I would like to hear more from you about this. Thank you. Um, right behind. Um, okay. uh, thank you very much uh, for the the presentations, it's a really <coughs> a very interesting uh, panel. I would like uh, to uh, deflect a bit uh, again upon uh, this notion of uh, the global south. I must say, particularly to Juan, that uh, I share uh, all the projects that uh, you have uh, presented in uh, your talk, both, uh, let's say, the epistemic uh, project uh, uh, summarized by uh, the slogan uh, universalizing the South and uh, kind of more practical projects uh, you have uh, spoken about, particularly the one regarding uh, translation. Nevertheless, uh, I continue to have uh, a lot of problems with the notion of uh, the Global South. I do not think that uh, such uh, meta-geographical notions as the Global North and the Global South, the First and the Third World, help us to uh, understand what uh, is uh, going on uh, in the world uh, in our time uh, from the point of view of, uh, let's say, the spatial coordinates uh, of uh, economic, uh, political, social, cultural uh, uh, development. 
when uh, you uh, were in a way compelled uh, to offer uh, a uh, definition of the global south, uh, you did that uh, in terms of center and periphery. The global south uh, is composed by uh, the places, the countries, the regions that are peripheral to uh, globalization. Well, do you think that China is peripheral to globalization nowadays? I think it's quite difficult uh, to uh, make such a point. I mean. And the same is true with India, with uh, a lot of other places that are usually, in a way, uh, subsumed under the construct of uh, global uh, south. Of course, I will not expand on that for want of time, but uh, I would urge you, but also the other panelists, uh, to reflect a bit uh, upon uh, a different kind uh, of uh, theoretical possibility, which is, uh, I mean, to challenge uh, in a radical way, from an epistemic point of view, precisely the binary center and periphery. And let me add a couple of sentences about the, uh, some tricky uh, practical implications of that, uh, speaking of uh, universities. When uh, uh, people move from the global north to the global south, what are they expecting? I'm thinking of students, first of all. We have uh, here in Bologna an exchange program with UNAM in Mexico City. And there are many students who go there huh, thinking that, that they are going to the periphery. They get there and uh, they discover quite quickly that uh, they are not in the periphery. That uh, uh, the kind of attitude that is nurtured by the center and periphery binary is misleading because uh, what uh, you find in the global south, uh, specifically in universities, is not a peripheral kind uh, of uh, situation. It's not a situation in which uh, you are, uh, in a way, interpolated uh, as somebody coming from the global north uh, and uh, having uh, to show solidarity to the victims that inhabit uh, peripheral spaces. Uh, so this issue of what the university stands for that was asked at the very uh, end by, uh, by the respondent. So I am wondering whether this, this question can be disentangled by the, by the one of who the university is for. And I'm thinking here about a book, a collaborative book by Isabel Stengers and Vincian Despre, which is called Women Who Make a Fuss. And there they uh, think about, they ask the question whether the lack of resistance to the current neoliberalization of universities might not be related to the uh, unwillingness of the universities to transform themselves in the face of, era of newcomers. So they talk about uh, the acceptance of girls amongst the ranks of educated men and brothers. Then they talk about migrants, about people from uh, lower income um, backgrounds and so on. And they say that every, every time when new, newcomers were accepted among the, the ranks of the one who, who might be, like, have the privilege of uh, education, they were asked to not, to not change what university is and not to, let's say, the concern was with not lowering the standard and uh, they, they were asked to, to enter without, but only on the terms of the ones who were already inside. So I was just thinking about when we, when we, when we try to ask the question of what, sh like how university should be defended or transformed, I think it's it's necessary to think not only in terms of uh, transformed in the face of um, impeding neoliberalization and this kind of threat, but also for the sake of uh, the university becoming worthy of those newcomers and of those, those people. Uh, I'm not sure whether this was Ashil a question or a comment. Sorry, Ashil had a question. 
my question is for the three uh, speakers, including uh, Premesh. I think we have been, uh, since yesterday, working uh, from the assumption that a proper sociology of the contemporary university uh, needs to start from a very specific premise, which is the advent of, quote unquote, neoliberalism. And almost every speaker has referred to um, this category, neoliberalism, as an explanatory uh, device to explain what has happened to the university. So my question to you is whether this is sufficient enough to explain the trajectories of the university in the kinds of regions of the world you come from, in South Africa, in the rest of the continent, or in other parts of Latin America. So, so, so that's the first question. The second question, we have been speaking as if the university is, uh, is made up of the humanities alone. We haven't at all referred to other uh, disciplines, uh, uh, nothing about engineering, uh, nothing about uh, medicine, uh, and so forth and so on. Would your analysis change in any case if you were to take into account the, uh, the fact that there's more to the university than the humanities? Did you, did you ask for the microphone? No. No. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Hi. Oh. <laughs> no, I want just to, let's say, take advantage in this question about the Global South, because uh, I would like to make a question to Juan. Uh, my question is, which kind of concept do, t do you think that Global South exactly is? Because, of course, it's not this could not be exactly an economical concept because all this relation center periphery is also internal to many countries, let's say in Latin America uh, and so on. Uh, it's the theory of underdevelopment was always uh, based on this kind of phenomena. But uh, we know that this is, is, this is not also a geographical concept because the frontiers of the South is always changing. It's depend well, let's say, Last year, Italy was described as a South Europe because, well, all this, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, all these problems concern the, the uh, European community. But my question is, you don't think that actually Global South is, is a psychological concept? Uh, it's, a, it's a concept that uh, we use just to, let's say, to try to explain our f or to share our feeling of displacement. It's not nothing more than a psychological concept. So do, do you want to respond to there's so many comments okay. there. So, so we'll just, um, do you want to take one, one more question by one yeah, way? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting panel. It's, <coughs> it's I follow that uh, the one question that the Pimish uh, also mentioned that uh, the unresolved question belong to the last generation and the continuation for this. Uh, conceptually speaking, how to deal with the conception, the early generations, because so-called the three worlds or the three continental and rather than the global south, because behind that the three worlds or the three continental idea was, is a very political. The global south sounds like that kind of the strong political implication, more or less in the sense of the modernization, though, though the, we use that was not 
in that sense. So that's the, we need to think about the uh, time change, how that the, the category transformation was happened from that early the generation of concepts to these global souls. This is the one question. <laughs> Second question is about the, uh, now the humanities and also the, about in, in now the so how to overcome the gap between the South and the North. That's the basic issue. I remember that uh, when the, the basic cons uh, the situation, I, th I remember that in the 1990s in America, for example, at that time, a lot of the reflections over the area studies, a lot of people complained that uh, we only produce the local knowledge, or oh, we are not belong, though we are the historian, literary historian, or some, but we are not belong to the humanities in the Western, in the European, or in American universities. So that's why only the Department of Literature, Department of History, or Comparative Literature produce that theories of look, those area studies, it was obviously because area studies in America, generally speaking, it came from the imperialistic projects for that, the whole global situation. But, but now, I think that the, how the universities, let's say in the global south, to develop their own new generation of knowledge about other countries, not follow that, the, uh, the, the old pattern, though it's not possible not to uh, not learn from that, even we know that there's some problems from there. Uh, these are, I think, are quite a big issue. In China, it's the case. And also, when I was in Latin America or in Africa, is that China is the big existence in these two continents. However, the knowledge about China was mainly through the English-speaking world, especially from America. How can we develop that, that knowledge that uh, both, I think, Chinese case is the same, very almost no leading scholars in our fields that the African specialists, Latin American specialists, as a leading scholar or the leading intellectuals was zero almost. However, look back to the, the 50s, 60s, that time, the very important, very famous scholars in China, intellectual world, where Indian studies or some other studies occupied a very high position, these phenomena disappeared. So we can think about it together with the older generation of concepts and the intellectual scenario, how that transformed to develop. We need not only the humanities, but also trying to develop that kind of knowledge about the, uh, each other. I mean, this is a really uh, big agenda. For China, it's a big, uh, I think, the, the alert, because now China became big power, and economically speaking, they want to develop these, these new disciplines. But what kind of the new discipline about Africa or the Latin America? Very big challenge. So that kind of the dialogue exchange between the South Africa or any other countries in Latin America and the Chinese case were very important, I think. Thank you. Um, so, do, do you want to respond, and then we then we take a set of questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just thinking about the project of theory from the south. My understanding is that it comes in the aftermath of postcolonial studies, and it tries to undo postcolonialism's preoccupation with two things. One is centres and margins. The way in which postcolonial studies constantly produced margins and reproduced centres. Um, as we were realizing that margins were no longer margins and centers were no longer centers. And my other um, sense of the weakness ultimately of postcolonial studies was the reproduction of alterity. Mm. So the, uh, the more you reproduce mm. alterity and investigate alterity, the more you reproduce it. Um, and I think the theory from the South came um, in a, a theoretical attempt in the aftermath of postcolonial studies to say, let's get away from both. Um, the critique of theory from the South, as the Komarovs would have it, is twofold as I understand it. The one made by Otto Kuesen is, in their version of theory from the South, it's still a question of holding up a mirror to the South so we can figure out what's going to happen to the North next, because we live in the North. We want to know more about the North than we necessarily 
want to know about the South, or we want to know about the South in order to understand the North. Uh, south as last frontier of capitalism. And the other critique that I have found most useful has been made by Juan in his response to the book, which is to say um, that um, the, uh, the Komarov's theory is really a theory of capitalism. You could replace the word theory with the word capital, and you would have an ingenious theory of capitalism. But you wouldn't really have um, a, an engagement with the question that literary scholars have been so long interested in, and by the way, theory from the South sort of marginalizes the literary completely, whereas postcolonial studies relied on it. It's a question of opacity, the question of what is it about me that you don't know and can't know and won't know, um, and why is it that one has to explain oneself to the world all the time. Um, so so the, that was the project of theory from the South um, in its, in its um, possibilities and failures. Um, Ashil, I think that um, no, I don't think that the history of neoliberalism can account for, for example, the contemporary history of the African university. Because I think that part of what explains the question of the African university is the failure of um, theories of Africanization and decolonization to produce, as you ha yourself have observed, theories of knowledge. So Africanization of the university and decolonization of the university becomes about um, replacing one set of people with another set of people. It doesn't necessarily think through what knowledge looks like and what it ought to look like at this point, or it doesn't do so carefully enough. And that, it seems to me, is not embedded in the stories that we tell about neoliberalism. It belongs to another set of political rhetorics and histories. And the other thing I would say is, yeah, we've been talking too fully about the humanities, and if we're thinking about the planetary university, then it is surely the biological sciences that have been onto interconnectedness um, and interdependency of uh, life forms, planetary life forms, human and non-human, long before the humanities. But ultimately, what is the sciences? What are the biological sciences with their theories of interdependency if they can't think forwards as the humanities can uh, in relation to projects that remain with us of living together, um, of, of, of um, imagining the planetary as um, a form of participation and care. So it seems to me that you need the, uh, you know, one needs to, to think about the, the sciences uh, in conjunction with the humanities in order to arrive at the planetary. And I think you're right, we haven't done enough of that today. Well, I'm not really one of the contributors to the panel. I was just, you know, trying to put forward a certain way in which we might put together these uh, these papers. But I must say that what I was trying to do in thinking about the supplement, in the kind of sense of Derrida's use of that term, is to think about, you know, add on or substitute, if you like, you know, and the aperia that forms around that possibility when one thinks about what it means to engage and encounter other modalities and forms of critique and, and, and knowledge formation. I mean, I suppose what I was, would say at the outset is that I would want this possibility of thinking something like the South, and I'm also uncomfortable with the term, uh, is to think it through a possibility of whether Europe might be thought of as not Eurocentric, or whether the idea of Europe might be recuperated, but in a way that it does not present itself as Eurocentric. So in the same way, you know, I think there's a set of questions that we ought to engage with. This is why the formulation, what we share but not in common, is so crucial for how I want to proceed. Um, because I think that if we're going to demarcate this, we're in the space of a global apartheid again, and we will reproduce the kind of conditions of marginalization, subjection, core periphery, and, and then be back in that circuit. Speaking of circuits, I think, you know, the problem with the, I did say the term neoliberalism was capacious uh, in much of the ways in which it gets used. Um, and, but what I'm worried about is beneath that, I suppose, is the question of the circularity of capital, which, which returns us to the same place, it seems. And what I'm trying to ask for is a, a point of escape, you know, a point of taking care of the limit, but also, you know, finding a way out of the script. Um, and I would say that, you know, part of this project of, would be to kind of 
map out what came apart in the kind of instance of nationalist formation in the South, uh, for example, uh, but elsewhere too. And I suspect that it is within that realm of technology, mnemonic solidarities, and, um, and anesthetics of the self. And I'm, I'm wanting to ask us to seriously think about that as a condition, as a gift for the possibility of thinking again, not only within the humanities, but the universities. The, the question of the other disciplines, very quickly, I shall, I think it's a superb question because, and partly I'm trying to say that we cannot work with the humanities alone. And the three points I'm, I'm kind of invoking, technology, mnemonic uh, solidarities, and, um, and aesthetics of the self tries to bring together a re-reading of the Kantian conflict of the faculties, which if you remember, they separates the university into competing disciplines, uh, the higher order disciplines, lower order disciplines, and now that has become the script, the nightmare by which we live. Uh, and I'm saying, you know, the work, the point, work of irony there produced the kind of reality effect, if you like, for our times. And I'm suggesting that we might want to rearrange the deck chairs of the university by reassembling those terms precisely so that we might find a way to think again within that space. Um, and I suspect that, you know, the papers that were presented here are asking us to think about what is unprecedented in the reinvention or the invention of the university in our times. So uh, in, in the five oh, minutes, sorry, I know that Antonio... The, the, we couldn't hear the question that came from the person just before Ashil. Okay. Um, um, just before Ashil. What? Sorry, you wanted to... We couldn't hear the question that came just from the Okay, person. but if you wanted to no, no, just leave it again. No, no, it no. Yeah. But just, no. Do, do you want to no, just leave minute. it? Just let one... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. You didn't hear my question. We couldn't or, hear it when you asked it the first time. We were struggling to hear it. Now I don't hear you. <laughs> yeah, one just, yeah, one just OK. Yeah. Go ahead, go well, ahead. it was a bit long, but my point was uh, related to, in, in, to the attempt to try to introduce or reintroduce the, the figure of the student, uh, which I guess it's like it's a concern that some of us share here. And my question uh, had something to do with uh, whether, uh, as if we follow the speculation of Isabel Stengers and Vincent Lespre, that uh, the failure of the university to transform itself in the face of newly arriving students, be them migrants, girls, um, um, working class students and so on, is in some way related to the lack of resistance to the current um, so-called neoliberalization. So when we think about resistance and transformation or defending something, what, what are we defending and whether, whether we might not try to not just react to some uh, forces that we con like consider threatening, uh, let's say forces of the market, but also transform uh, this in these institutions uh, from the point of view of a concern with um, sh reshaping knowledge for someone, like for students? I don't know. Uh, just one minute briefly to, on the question of the South. Um, I would like to suggest, that's why I mentioned a couple of times, and other people have mentioned as well, that the concept of the Global South practically came out uh, at the post call, the immediate post call moment. Uh, moment and the, the moment of uh, the beginning of this round of globalization. So what if the concept of the global south, it's more about the global than the south? Uh, it, it's, it's trying to name something that is a discontent in globalization. And there I would agree with you, and we can continue over the birra, um, that center periphery is a type of dichotomy that comes from a previous time and a previous uh, moment in social theory. But at the same time, Global South is naming um, the new levels of inequality and exclusion within globalization that are not anymore about one center and a peripheral world, but about uh, entangled, to use Sarah's term, 
variegated peripheries within the center. So in that sense, it's a, it's a misnomer, but it's a political and economic concept. It's not geographical. And maybe as Vladimir suggested, it's a psychoanalytic concept because it's, it's trying to name a symptom for which we don't have yet the, the vocabulary. But definitely there's something uh, happening here that we have to name, and, and this is the term that, that names that, that void and that ambiguity. Having said that, a European citizen and an Italian citizen can travel more or less freely around the world, and a citizen of new economic powers like Brazil or India cannot. We have international criminal courts that have global jurisdiction, but they only prosecute African uh, leaders of state. You have NATO and UN and G20 and you name it, and the imbalances of power, I think, uh, within these new emergent economies in the peripheries are still very obvious. And I think that imbalance is what the term Global South is trying to, to allude to. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll, do, do, do we have time for, um, it's just that Antonio took, requested me to um, close the session by quarter past six. So we are nearing that, and uh, okay, so uh, I know there is a lot more uh, conversation to happen, but uh, please join me in thanking our panel for, for just very, very amazing. <laughs>